now we are in the middle of function approximation and the next chapter is the method of least squares which is uh, really very important I would say this is for an applied engineer one of the most important mathematical techniques uh, this is something you really can use in, in almost all applications because this is the uh, tool uh, for approximating functions given data points uh? and we will look at this uh, today and we start with an application I mean this is one of thousands of examples where you can use least squares and this is an application where we uh, used it in uh, our RoboCup project oh, this was I would say about four years ago huh? um, what is RoboCup? I mean this is little robots that play soccer um, and uh, I mean we, we uh, built such a robot for the middle size league may I show you um, uh, some videos that maybe look oh oh no they ah uh, oh, sorry um, okay so then we, we start immediately with this uh, video this is uh, at the German Open 2008 in Paderborn and this is our robot uh, that was uh, as you can see it's the goalie um, together with the team of University Ulm uh, we played there and you see how it follows the movements of the ball and this is in the game against uh, University Eindhoven and you see they couldn't score a goal against this goalie yeah okay so this is just a very short part out of this uh, game I mean <laughs> if we would show you the whole game <laughs> then it would be uh, at least the second half of the game would be kind of boring because during the whole second half um, the robot didn't work anymore uh, <laughs> because there was some quite tough uh, hit of an opponent and the uh, our goalie was hit quite hard and then there was due to some electrical problem um, the, the, the computer crashed and so the robot didn't move anymore but this was actually quite good because then the robot was right in the middle of the goal and our opponent this University Eindhoven they had perfect kicks and they always kicked right at the middle of, of the goal <laughs> and so maybe it was good that the robot did not move <laughs> but I mean th that's how RoboCup goes uh, okay um, and n now let me let me show you um, how I mean a little bit about how we developed this robot um, this is a picture of the robot um, where you can see a little bit how technical it is and we will now focus on this video camera this video camera looks straight up into the air but there is uh, a mirror yeah? it's a parabolic mirror and due to this parabolic mirror we get a, a 360 degree view of the environment and uh, the picture th then what you can see from this camera image that's what we have here uh, that's like if you take a, a fish eye camera and look on the scene from the top uh, um, and that's how you can see I mean here you see these uh, three uh, poles and uh, these white lines here are the, the uh, the RoboCup playground uh, this here is the goal and of course there is a strong distortion I mean straight lines are no longer straight they are 
kind of circles. And now we had to find an algorithm um, that rectifies the whole image, such that rectangles are really rectangles on the picture. Yeah? Um, and how does that work? Um, I mean, we, uh, we try to solve the problem. So now suppose this is the robot, and um, here we have the camera, and there is this parabolic mirror, and now, um, for example, here we have the ground, and the, the important thing is to detect a ball somewhere. And of course the robot needs to know where the ball is. Yeah? And I mean, determining the angle of the ball is not so difficult. I mean, if this is the axis of the robot, uh, and we see the ball here, then it's not difficult to, de to determine this angle uh, right from the pixel image. Yeah? We know the, the center point, we know this direction, we know this direction, so it's easy to determine this angle. But what's not so easy is to determine how far is the ball away from the robot. Huh? And this is due to this nonlinear distortion of, of the image. And look, I mean, uh, there is a, a ray of light coming from the ball going here, and then it's reflected by this parabolic mirror, and it enters the camera like that. Huh? And uh, so if the ball would be closer, then this would be maybe like this. Huh? And if the, the distance of the ball is infinite, then it would be like that. Huh? And we tried then, I mean, we actually, uh, with a lot of mathematics, we did trigonometry with all these uh, um, distances and with the formula of the parabola. And finally, it turned out it worked quite well, but not good. Uh, I mean, there were, there were some little errors. I mean, if you have this length a uh, few millimeters wrong, then you already get an error and so on. Uh, and we tried to adjust it, but it didn't work. And then we said, OK, just stop this weird calculation. Let's do function approximation. We approximated a function. Uh, and then we didn't have to look at all at these technical details of this machine here. I mean, what, what do we want? We want to have a mapping that maps us uh, from pixels on our image. Look, it's, it's not hard to compute the distance from the center of the picture, from the camera, to the ball in pixels. I mean, that can be done just by easy image processing. So we know the distance of the ball on our non-rectified pic picture in pixels. That's what we know here. And now we want to map this pixel distance onto a millimeter distance in the real world. Uh, we need such a function. And this function, I can show you, this is the function. It looks like that. Uh, we want to determine this function. And now what we did is, we collected some points here, and then approximated a function through these points, and everything was perfect. Now where do we get these points from? Let me see, yeah. <coughs> We did the following on, on the ground. We put some white marks, one here, then I don't know the distance, what it was. Every 20 centimeters there was a little, actually a little white mark. Huh? And so we know here is a mark and then 20 centimeters further, there is another mark, and so on. We put these marks, so 
So we have the kind of the y values of our points. And then we looked at our pixel image and you see the first mark is here, the second is here, and so on. And that's how we got these points. Okay? And what's missing is just a function through these points. And now how do we get a function? I mean, we did some, something quite simple. We said, okay, let's fit a polynomial. Let's just try it with a polynomial. But if we do polynomial interpolation, which you know already, we would get problems. What kind of problem would we get if we would do the naive polynomial interpolation? Yeah. So the, the degree of the polynomial would then be the number of points minus one. Yeah? And now let's count how many points we have. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 17 points. 18. And I guess here, yeah, it might be 18 or 19 points. So the degree of the polynomial would be 17 or 18. And that's too high. That's too high. We would, of course, get uh, weird oscillations at least in this region. Definitely. We would had, have bad oscillations around here. Huh? OK. So now we said, OK, let's fit a polynomial of smaller degree through these points. I mean, we could actually have tried it with splines. Yeah, that might be, might be interesting to do it with splines, but we didn't do it. I can, can't tell you what, how the result would look like. What we did is we fitted a polynomial of degree 6 through these points. But now, I mean, if you would try to do it with the polynomial interpolation mechanism, it wouldn't work. Why wouldn't it work? Or, I mean, it actually could work, but you would have to modify the problem a little bit. What would you do? I mean, I give you these points and ask you, fit a polynomial of degree 6. We have to delete some points. Yeah, that's a good idea. Why not? You just delete points. Huh? And then you get a polynomial of degree 6 and you will then see. It may happen that, I mean, if you would delete these uh, two points, you may get something like that, which is not too good. Huh? But you could at least try. I mean, at least you could give it a try and you would see what happens. But... Why would you need to delete points? Why don't you try it to use all the points? What would happen? The error will increase. Excuse me? The error will increase. The error will increase if you use all points? Mm, no. You would get a, an even more severe problem. You get an overdetermined system. Yes. Yes. You, you would get an overdetermined system. Yeah? So you would have 19 equations for seven unknowns. And we do not know yet how to solve overdetermined systems. Actually, it is impossible to solve an overdetermined system in the general case. So if all the equations are linearly independent, then it is impossible. Uh, then it is impossible to solve such an overdetermined system. Uh, um, it is impossible to get an exact solution for an overdetermined system. And now what we will do now is the method of least squares is a method to find an approximate solution 
for such an overdetermined system. Uh, you will not get an exact solution. Exact solution would mean our function hits all the data points. And this is impossible. And because it is impossible, we cannot require a polynomial of degree 6 to hit 19 points. This is impossible. So we have to weaken our requirements. And our weaker requirement now is, let's try to find a polynomial of degree 6 that deviates as little as possible from the points. That's what we do now. And that's the method of least squares. Okay, and why, why is it called the method of least squares? Because what we now require is that the sum of the deviations of the function from all the points is minimal. And we will not just use the sum of the absolute values of the deviations, we will use the sum of the squares of all the deviations. Uh, and that's why it's called the method of least squares. The sum of the square deviations should be the least, least squares method. Uh, and if you look at this picture a little bit closer, um, then you will see that it is not an exact solution. For example here, this point is not hit in the middle, and this one too, and this one too. So this is a very good solution, but it's not exact. Okay, so now let's go back to the math. Okay, given our now n data points, the same thing as all the time before. And given is also, and that's important, given is a class of functions. Such a class of functions, f of one, uh, depending on one variable x and k parameters. Huh? For example, this might be a polynomial of degree 6. Huh? A polynomial of degree 6 that depends on our variable x and 7 coefficients. These are the a1 through a7 then. Yeah? So k is the number of coefficients which might be the degree of the polynomial and n is the number of points. And typically k is uh, less than or equal to n. I mean that means we do have an overdetermined system. Huh? More points than parameters to be determined. Okay, and now what we do is we weaken our requirement. We only want the error to be as small as possible. And this is the error. Capital E of F of x1 minus y1. I mean, this is the y component of the first given point. And this is uh, the value of our function at, the, at that point. And if they are not equal, these two, then this is non-zero. And uh, we do have this difference, of course, for all data points, for all n points. And, uh, and this error, I mean, this here is the formula for the error, which is the sum of all the squares of the differences. Why do we need the squares here? If you would omit this second power there, that wouldn't be too good. What would be the disadvantage of this? Oh yes, but is this a problem? I mean, an error could be negative. Why not? Can be positive, can be negative. But uh, negative 
value would decrease the arrow, the pink sum. But if I have two negative values, they sum, and then it would be a large negative error, wouldn't it? Yes, but if I have positive and negative errors, okay. it would be zero. Yeah. It might be zero. Yeah. If you have positive and negative errors, they might cancel out each other, and at the end, you would have an error equal to zero. Example. Let's look at the, an example. If these are our data points, and our approximating function would be this, and then you have this positive error, this negative, this positive, and this negative error, and maybe the sum of these would be zero, even though it's not a good approximation. And therefore, we should either use the absolute values of these distances, or the squares. And what we do is we use the squares. I mean, there are methods that use the absolute values and not the squares, but they are mathematically more difficult. Why? Because the absolute value is not nice at all here. Why is it not nice? Look, if we have x here and now we the absolute value is this function. This is the absolute value of x. Okay, and x squared is, I mean, this looks like that. This is x squared. Um, and now the problem is right here, because the absolute value is not differentiable in the origin. And that's actually what we need. We need this function to be, to be differentiable in the origin. Because right now we will differentiate this error function. And this is not possible with the absolute value. And that's why we don't like it. Huh? I mean, that's a, a really pragmatic approach. Uh, but that's, that's uh, quite often in mathematics. I mean, if we can't solve something, we will try it uh, otherwise. And that's what we do here. OK, so we use the, the square here. This is our error function. And now our function f of xi has such a type, f of x and the parameters. And now we simplify the whole thing. I mean, this might be something very general. And now we restrict ourselves to functions which are linear combinations of basis functions. That's very important. Look, now our function has to be a sum of k basis functions, each one with its associated coefficient. Why do we do this? Because these coefficients appear linearly in the function. And that's why, uh, very important because only in this case will we get um, a linear system of equations. If the system of equations would be nonlinear, uh, we would have a hard time. OK, so we just take uh, such a type of function. And, but what's very important is, I mean, this is called linear approximation. But what, what we have at the end needs not to be a linear function. It may be a polynomial of degree 6. These basis functions may be trigonometric. It may, it may be whatever. Huh? That doesn't matter. You can have arbitrary nonlinear functions. What's important is that these coefficients appear linearly. It's not allowed to have them in the exponent of something or whatever. OK, and now with this ansatz for our function f, now what is our goal? Our goal is to determine these coefficients. These coefficients a1 through ak, these are again our unknowns. We want to determine these coefficients. 
and now it's important, such that this error function is minimal. We want to minimize this error function. Okay, now we will apply the procedure we know from a multi-dimensional analysis. I mean, even though this function f only has own ver one variable, but actually these are our variables, the coefficients. And we have many coefficients, so now we are in high-dimensional analysis. So we take the first derivative of this error function. I mean, actually here we have it. This is now our error function. Now we take all the first partial derivatives of this error function with respect to a1, a2, and so on. That's what we have here. Partial derivative with respect to any of these variables hj. And, uh, yeah, now let's go back here. Yeah, look, actually here we have a double sum. This is a sum, and here again we have a sum over uh, j equal, uh, from j equal 1 to k over these terms. And, uh, oh, it's sorry, the, the name of this uh, running index is called L. Sum over L equal 1 to k a L f L of xi minus yi times fj of xi. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, this is already the first derivative. Um, so what, what we had before was a square here, and this was missing. So let's, yeah. So what we have before we take the derivative is, we don't have this 2, we don't have this guy, we have the 2. And now the first derivative is the 2, the 2 goes down here, um, yeah, because, I mean, this is a square term, so the outer derivative, we get the 2 down here, um, and then we have to take the inner derivative of this term. Huh? This is the derivative of a sum of such terms. With respect to a j. Derivative with respect to a j. Where does a j occur, occur? It occurs, of course, in this sum. The j term in this sum is the relevant term. All the other terms will be zero when we derive them with respect to a j. So there is only one term remaining which is the one for L equal J. And now then the derivative is just Fj of Xi. And that's what we get here. Okay, so that's the first derivative. And this is actually not one equation, it is K equations. I mean, we do this for j equal 1 to k. Look here. So we get k equations for k unknowns. And now you see that we have done the right thing. Because we get a linear system with a square matrix. k unknowns, k equations. Was there a question? Yeah, I don't get the autoderivative. Um, I think there's an A missing. Could it be? No. Okay. <laughs> then I don't know where the A is going. Okay, this A? Yeah. Uh, here? Yeah. Yeah. Look, if you derive x times the sine of A with respect to x, this is, of course, the sine of A. And now what we have is and this is the sine of x. So where is the A? It's just gone. Okay? OK, 
Okay, so this is our derivative. These are our k derivatives. And now, in order to find a minimum, we have to set all these derivatives equal to zero. All these have to be zero. Okay, so we set this right hand side equal to zero and we already bring this negative part to the right hand side here. So this negative part is, this is outside this sum, so it's the sum over a equal 1 to n of yi times fj of xi. Okay? That's the right hand side and all the rest here is on the left hand side. I mean, from this times that you get this product. Okay, so far? Already here can we see that this is a linear system with k equations for k unknowns. And now we just do a little bit of pretty printing uh, and then it looks nicer. What we do is First step is we exchange the order of these two sums. Huh? For finite sums, this is no problem. If you have infinite sums, two infinite sums, you have to be careful when you exchange the order. But in finite sums, it's no problem. Okay, so we exchange these two sums. Um, and then the sum over i now is the inner sum. And because it's a sum over i, we can of course draw a l before the sum. Because it does not depend on i. It depends on l and that's why we cannot draw it out here. And these two terms, um, yeah, this term and this term, both de uh, depend on i. That's why they have to stay inside here. Okay, the right hand side is unchanged and now if we look at this sum here, this whole sum is just a matrix element. What we immediately see, don't you? Why is this a matrix element? Or, I mean, why can we call this matrix element? Because it's a JL. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for this answer. Of course, I mean, it's written on the slide. It's a JL. Of course. But my question is, why is this a JL? Why can we say this whole sum and look, there are so many indices. Why is this a matrix element? Why isn't it a IJL? Why don't we use uh, three indices? And if we would have three indices, it would not be a matrix element. Then it would be an element of a three-dimensional tensor. Why is it a matrix element? Oh, you should see this. Why does this index i not occur outside there in, uh, as an index of the matrix element? Because it is the summation index. And such a summation, a summation index is only visible inside the sum. But if you look at this sum from outside, it does not appear. That's the same thing as if you have an integral. I mean, the integration variable, maybe x, is not relevant. You could call it x or t or whatever. It does not matter. And once the integral is computed, uh, this variable vanishes. 
once this sum is evaluated, the I doesn't uh, exist anymore. Okay? So this whole thing depends on two discrete indices, J and L. And that's why, I mean, everything that has two discrete indices with a finite range, that's what we call a matrix. Okay, so this is a matrix element, A, J, L. And look at the right hand side, this is an object with one index, J. And that's what we typically call a vector, if the range of this index is finite. Okay, so now we can write this whole thing in this form. So we have the sum over L, HAL times AL equal to BJ. And of course, I mean, we should really write it in uh, vector form. So we have a matrix A times a vector lowercase a is equal to vector B. This is the vector notation of this linear system. Okay, and I mean this linear system is called the normal equations. These are the so-called normal equations and they have to be solved. And now you know the algorithm to do least squares approximation. What do you have to do? You have to determine these matrix elements you have to determine the components of the right-hand side vector and once you have these guys you just use some function like linear solve from Mathematica and solve it. That's it. It's really easy. And we now have a method to solve over-determined systems. Huh? not exactly solve, but approximately. To find an approximate solution for overdetermined linear systems. But, I mean, actually, this is a method to approximate functions to given points. And look, it is not, it is not difficult to determine these matrix elements. It's easy. What do you need? You need all the basis functions. If it's a polynomial of degree 6, then, I mean, you have a basis function f1, which is 1, f2 is x, f3 is x squared, f4 is x power 3, and so on. Uh, so this, these fls may be the powers of x, or it may be a sign or whatever. You can select, you actually have to select these basis functions. Huh? That's the hard part. You have to select these basis functions, but once you have selected them, then you know them. And of course you have to know the, the data points, these xi, but I mean they are given. And here for the right hand side, again you need the basis functions, you need the x components of your data points, and you need the y components of the data points. So this is easy. And actually, in, if you write this, I have a nice little Mathematica program for doing this. It is three or four lines. It's really easy. I mean, you can, you can directly write this HAL is equal to this. And in Octave it's similar. Okay, now let's do it. Before we go back to our RoboCup example, let's do it, let's apply it manually to an extremely simple example. So we want to determine these uh, three functions of uh, quadratic polynomial of a parabola. Given these four points, um, and you see it is overdetermined. Three coefficients but four points. 
And uh, I mean, here you see the solution. These are the points, and this is the best parabola through these points. Um, okay, this is our linear system to be solved. This is the equation to determine our matrix elements HAL. And this is for the right hand side components, and this is the matrix. Look, this is this guy here is A11. Oops. This is A11. A11 is you take F1 times F1. First basis function times itself. First basis function is x squared. x squared times x squared is x power 4. Um, okay, so we have the sum over i of xi fourth power. Okay, and um, here we have a 1, 2. So this is f1 times f2, x squared times x, which is x power 3. So we have the sum over all third powers of the xi. And so on. That's how we get this matrix. But now, please, if there is such a uh, problem in the exam, don't start calculating always this matrix and say, OK, Professor Erdl said uh, A11 always is the sum of the fourth powers of the, of the points. It's only in this example where we use this polynomial. Okay, and now we take all these x values here, um, 0, 2, 3, and 4, and that's why we get this matrix. And now with the right-hand sides, um, we get f1, which is x squared, f2, which is x, and f3, which is 1 here, times the y values. Okay, and then we use these values from above and we get this vector. And now we have the linear system. And this is the solution. I mean, you can easily check that this is the correct solution. And if we draw the solution, that's the parabola. Um, okay. Questions about this example? Questions about the derivation of the normal equations? Um, question to this example. If you ask uh, the example passed like this, can we solve it also with the van der Waals matrix? No. I mean, uh, I don't. For, uh, I, I, it's not forbidden. But I believe it doesn't work. I don't know. I mean, do you know a method that works with the Van der Monde matrix here? I think there is an example I did with the Van der Monde and it works. There are examples where it works. When does it work, the Van der Monde matrix, to apply it here? There is one special case where this works. But this is... Um, not normal. Okay. It works if k is equal to n. The number of basis functions is equal to the number of points because then you get a square matrix and then you can of course apply polynomial interpolation. Um, ah, sorry, no, it's even more special. It only works if k is equal to n and if your function is a polynomial. But if you have something else, some other basis functions, then please don't use the Van der Monde matrix. So I would not recommend to, to try this here.
Okay, no more questions? That makes me happy because now you seem to have understood one of the most important chapters of mathematics for engineers ever. At least, I mean, that was for me um, one of the most impressive and most important things in math at all for engineers. Because whenever you have given data points and uh, you have to approximate a function through these data points, it almost always works. You can apply it almost always. There is, there is a, I mean, there are scenarios where you cannot apply this. And this is when the number of basis functions is greater than the number of points. So for example, you want to fit a polynomial of degree 7 to 3 points. Here you can't apply this mechanism, but we will see in a few minutes how we even can, then can apply a similar method. Um, the only drawback of this method is um, it requires a little bit of human engineering. I mean, you have to be a little bit smart to apply this method. What is the difficulty? I mean, it's everything fully automatic, apart one important step. You have to use your brain for what? Sorry? Yes, you have to determine these basis functions. Yeah? Um, and uh, look at this example, that's not too bad. Maybe this was not a good idea to use a parabola to fit to these four points. Maybe it was a good idea. And this really depends on your application. Um, so you, re you really have to think about these basis functions. That's very important. Look, suppose from some background knowledge I know that these data points come from a quadratic process where the underlying function is a parabola, but we just have a lot of noise. If there is this knowledge, the data come from a parabola with some Gaussian noise on it, or some other noise, then please use a parabola to fit here. If there is this knowledge, please apply this knowledge. Do not ignore. Uh, whenever you have prior knowledge about the source of the data, you have to apply this knowledge, otherwise the result would not be good enough. But if there is no such knowledge, then the problem is harder. If there is no prior knowledge and you are given just the points, then assuming this should be a parabola would be ad hoc entering some, some, some knowledge. Yeah? You see, if you know nothing about the source of the data, the problem is hard. I mean, this may be a quadratic process with some noise, but it may be a different process with no noise. And if you know there is no noise, then of course you should consider different function classes. Function classes that are powerful enough to exactly hit these points. Yeah? I mean, then you could say, okay, we've given four points, let's try it with a polynomial of degree three. And then you would exactly hit all the points but that might produce oscillations which are not so nice. No? Okay, but so much for now. We have solved this tiny little problem manually 
And now let's go back to the RoboCup uh, application. I mean, you know already everything. I mean, yeah. what, what should I tell you about this? Now you know how to solve it. Huh? You're given 18 points and you're looking for seven parameters of a polynomial of degree 6. And um, here you have the polynomial. These are the coefficients which are the result of the normal equations. Oh yes, and uh, now once we have this polynomial, we know the real, the correct, the correct distances of these objects and, and not, not only for the ball, for every object we see on the ground. And so now we can rectify our images. And here you see, uh, this is an original image. I mean, this is after the Kenny edge detection. Yeah? So we already run image processing algorithms. Uh, we uh, extracted the edges. These are the white lines on the playground. And you see these are like circles. And now we apply this formula and that's what we get. And it really looks nice, doesn't it? So we really have straight lines here. We have uh, a right angle here and here. So that's the rectified picture. Okay. So, I mean, isn't it surprising that we can do this rectification with such a simple function approximation mechanism? Okay, yeah, but now we come back to mathematics. Uh, of course, we want to know whether these normal equations are solvable first and whether they have a unique solution. Now, what do you know from Gilbert Strang? I mean, we are talking about solving linear systems. We know that our coefficient matrix is a square matrix. Now, what do you know about this? Is there always a unique solution? Yes when the matrix is non-singular. Yeah? So we have to make sure that this matrix is non-singular. Yeah? Um, and here we have the theorem. This is the precondition for the matrix being non-singular. The normal equations are uniquely solvable if and only if these vectors are linearly independent. And now let's look at these vectors. So for this vector, we take the first basis function and apply it to all data points. F1 applied to x1 through xn. And this gives us a vector of length n. And we do have k such vectors. I mean, and here you see why we, at the beginning, we did require that k is less than or equal to n. If k would be bigger than n, we would have a problem here. Why? Because we have more unknowns than equations. We have more unknowns. Oh, I mean, here we don't have equations. Why do we have a problem here? If k would be equal to n plus 1, for example. It wouldn't be a square matrix. You mean the matrix you form out of all these vectors? It wouldn't be a square matrix. Yes, but here it also wouldn't be a square matrix. If k is less than n, only if k is equal to n is a square matrix. But what's the problem is if k is uh, greater than n? We have vectors of length n. 
So we are in an n-dimensional space. Is it possible that n plus 1 vectors in an n-dimensional space are linearly independent? No. It's impossible. So we have to require that k at most is equal to n. Okay. Yeah. So we have to we have to set up these vectors and then prove that they are linearly independent. That's it. We don't prove this theorem, but of course it's important to know it. Yeah. And now to illustrate uh, this linear independence, suppose we have n data points and two basis, only two basis functions, f1 and f2. Then we take this vector f2 applied to all points and f1 applied to all points and suppose this vector is twice the other vector. And this is of course, these guys are then linearly, linearly dependent. And now if we draw our x values here on this x-axis, then applying our function to all points may look like this, f1. And now if f2 applied to all the data points is exactly twice, then it would look kind of like that. Huh? Um, and this is not allowed. This is not allowed. So, in some sense, these basis functions have to be different enough. Yeah? Of course, I mean, what's, what's definitely not allowed is that these basis functions, one basis function is a multiple of another. Or if one basis function is a linear combination of uh, two or more others. Yeah? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, due to time reasons, I don't, I don't uh, give you this proof now. So we will just omit this proof. It is not difficult. With this linear algebra knowledge we have, it is quite simple to understand this proof. Um, yeah. And also I will, I want to, no, let, let's look at this example. This is um, an example, it's actually the example we had before. This, I mean, we go back to this little example we had. You know, we had given these four points, we had given these basis functions, we have three basis functions, and now we prove that um, this theorem is applicable. That means these vectors of all these basis functions have to be linearly independent. That's what we show now. So we apply f1 to all four data points and f1 is the square. So we have 0 squared, uh, 2 squared, 3 squared and 4 squared. Uh, um, and now f2 is x. So these are just the x values, 0, 2, 3, 4. And f3 is equal to 1. So this is the vector, sorry you can't see it, the vector of all 1's. And now we have to show that these three vectors are linearly independent. Three vectors are linearly independent if the only multiples of such a linear combination that solve this equation equals zero are zeros. So we have to prove that <coughs> uh, A, B and C have to be zero. Uh, and then we have shown the vectors are linearly independent. Now to see that c is equal to zero is, is easy. Look at the first equation. The first equation just reads c equals zero. 
OK, so we know that c is equal to 0. Uh, so we can set c equals 0, and we get this new equation here. And I mean, I would actually like to say you immediately see that the only solution is a and b equals 0. Why? Because it's an overdetermined system, we have uh, three equations for two unknowns. And in such a case, there can only be a unique solution, uh, no, there can only be a solution if at least two of these, no, if these three equations are linearly dependent. Huh? So these uh, three equations, um, this one, this one, and this one, have to be linearly dependent, um, and that's easy to see that they are not linearly dependent. Okay, yeah. Now let's look at a special case. Um, oh, should we look at this? No. I mean, that's really a new, uh, just a special case. It's, it's actually boring. Um, so what we do is we, we apply our method to the example where the first basis function is x and the second basis function is 1. And we determine do these two coefficients, a and b. And what you, what you see here is it's not just the application of the method, it's actually the derivation again. So for those among you who had uh, problems understanding um, this, so we made this ansatz and then took the partial derivative, set them zero. If this was too difficult for you, then go into the script and first read this. It's a little bit simpler. Huh? Um, and at the end, you see partial derivative with respect to a set to zero, to b set to zero, and finally you get these results. The coefficient a is equal to this formula and b is equal to this formula. I mean, the nice thing here is we can write down an explicit formula which is not too long for a and b. Huh? Um, yeah. Okay, we will, but we will now look at this, which is the statistical justification of our method. At the beginning, look, how did we start? We started with a task like that. Given our data points, we want to have a function which approximates the data points as good as possible. And we require the sum of the squared distances to be minimal. And I said you could also use the sum of the absolute values, or you could use the sum of the fourth powers of the distances. It all would work. I mean, the one would be more difficult and the other less difficult. The easiest one was the sum of the squares. That's why we did it. Yeah? Um, but, I mean, not always is the easiest way the best way. And that's what I want to show you now, that this was not a bad selection. It was actually a good selection because now we will look at a trivial example and we'll see that the result is what we would expect. Yeah? What we do is, look, such a cloud of points is given. These are our data points. And now we want to fit a constant function uh, to it. Yeah? We are looking for a constant function. 
So our function is f of x is equal to a. No more x appears here, of course. Now, first question is, what are the basis functions? Only one. So the only one basis function is one. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. It's, uh, so over there, it's not a coefficient is not a, it's called c. Yeah? Our sum of squared errors here f of xi minus yi is the sum over c, which is the coefficient to be determined, minus yi squared. Okay, now take the first derivative, set it equal to zero. That's what we, that's the first derivative, we get the two here, and the inner derivative is one, so nothing changes. So this is equal to 2 times the sum over c minus the sum over the yi. So we just draw the sum into the brackets. Okay, and what is the sum, this sum? The c is constant, it does not de depend on i. So we can draw the c before the sum. So then we have the sum i equal 1 through n of 1 and this of course is n. So we get n times c. And now we set the whole thing here equal to 0. And now of course this 2 cancels out. And we get n times c is equal to the sum of the yi. We solve it for c, and that's what we get. And now look at this formula, isn't it nice? It's the arithmetic mean of all the y values. Let's look back to our picture. If you wouldn't know about this function approximation stuff, and I would give you such data points and would ask you, look at some average value which is actually a constant function, is nothing but a kind of an average value, then I would expect most of you would have computed the arithmetic mean. Maybe someone would have computed the geometric or another person the harmonic mean, but I would guess 99% would use the arithmetic mean. Um, and that's what the method of least squares gives us. So it's not too bad a method. Okay, yeah. Now there appears a question, how good are these results that we get? And now let's look at this picture. Suppose we are given these points. And we want to determine a straight line. So we have two basis functions, which are x and 1. And we determine a straight line. That might be the result. But now my question is, suppose these data points are noisy. So there is some random noise on the data points. How does the shape of our approximated function depend on the noise in the data points. I mean the result might, the correct result might be this line or it might be this line. I mean these data points they come from some underlying process and if this process is linear with some added noise then the question is is our straight line close to the original linear process or not? What is the error in our parameters? There may be an error in this um, constant b, this offset, and there of course also may be an error in the slope of our straight line. And there is a way to estimate the accuracy of our parameters. You can apply this method always, but it's particularly easy 
if um, if you approximate a straight line, uh, because then we can give explicit formulas. Um, yeah. Now we have to remind what we did a few weeks ago. I presented you the um, the error propagation formula. Do you remember? That was uh, in multi-dimensional analysis. Um, there was the, there is a formula for the total differential, and an application of this formula leads us to the error propagation uh, law. And this is the law of error propagation. Huh? We assume that there are some, let's look at the data points. We assume that in these data points there are some errors, but only errors in the y direction. So each one of these points would have such an error bar. And so on. Huh? So we assume here that the x values, they are all exact, but there may be an error in the y direction on each point. And we know this error, uh, which is, um, I guess it's called delta A here. No, delta yi. Delta yi, these are the errors in all the points. And this is the error propagation formula. What do we need to know? Look, we need to know the partial derivative of the coefficients with respect to the y values. Huh? And I mean, we do have a formula for the coefficients. And this is this formula. Look, this is the formula for the a coefficient, depends on the x and y values and b also depends on the x and y values. And now we need to take the partial derivative of the formula for a here. Uh, sorry for the, I mean this is the general formula when we have n coefficients. Now in this linear example we had just two, two coefficients a and b. So the first partial derivative is the a uh, with respect to the yj, and then the second is uh, the partial derivative of b with respect to all the yi. Yeah. So this is the, uh, the formula to be applied, and I also showed you at that time the formula for the mean error. This is the formula for the maximum error. This is the formula for the mean error. And I also told you that when, uh, when we have many data points, then um, the probability that all the errors add up in the same direction is very small. And therefore, the maximum error gives you um, an estimate which is too rough. Huh? And then you should use this formula. Okay, but if we apply this formula for the maximum error to straight line regression, so we take these partial derivatives which are not hard to calculate, we have them here, um, and then we can, I mean this is the formula for delta E, that's important now. This gives us our uh, error with respect to the slope of the line. This gives us the error with respect to the vertical offset. And you see, of course, you need these partial derivatives. Um, so of A with respect to Yj, and here of B with respect to y j. So you need to apply to um, replace this here and this here. And then you can calculate uh, these errors. Okay. 
Yeah, now the, let's talk about the limitations of this method. It, we can only apply least squares if our coefficients appear linearly. We cannot apply it for such a task. Look, suppose we are looking for a function v depending on the variable u with these unknown coefficients c and d. Because this coefficient d appears in the exponent. I mean, you could do the whole derivation, but what would be the problem? Where would you get a problem? I mean, you can, it's no problem to calculate the partial derivative of, of something like that. You can set it equal to zero. You can solve the system with k equations for k unknowns, and then you're finished. But now I cheated. Where did I cheat? It won't be solvable because it wouldn't be a matrix. Then. Like you said, uh, it would be. It should have. It should be vectors. No. Yes. Yes. You're right. I mean, it wouldn't be a matrix. The problem is you wouldn't get linear equations. Yeah. You would get k equations for k unknowns, but they would be nonlinear. Have you ever at school solved um, three nonlinear equations with three unknowns? Maybe, but this is possible only in very, very, very special cases. Huh? And normally it is very hard, at least symbolically. You could then try numerically, and in some cases this works well, in other cases it would be extremely difficult numerically. Yeah, that's a problem. And, I mean, here I show you two special cases where it is still possible to, to do least squares with a little trick. Yeah? And the trick is to linearize this equation. This can be linearized by just applying the logarithm on left and right hand side. So you get log of v is equal to log c plus d times log u. Isn't that nice? You see what happens. The d comes down from the exponent and now just is a linear factor. And now we substitute um, we call, uh, so we make a variable substitution, y is equal to log v, x is equal to log u, um, and a1 is log c, a2 is d. If we do this substitution, and then everything is trivial, and this is our function. And now, now we know how to apply least squares, no problem. Okay? Again. So what to do? First step is apply the logarithm. Then we do these variable substitutions and we get a linear, a linear equation. And then with this linear equation we apply least squares. But be careful. Be careful. If this is your task, let's mark it. If this is our task, then the table of our data points, how does it look? It looks like u1, v1, u2, v2, and so on, up to un, vn. This is the set of our data points, okay? And now, we make these 
variable transformations. So that means we have to transform, uh, these data have to be transformed into, um, so the u's are transformed into x1, comma, and the v's are transformed into the y's, yeah, y1, and so on. Okay, that's important. I mean, we do this transformation, and then we have this new, this new equation, and we do least squares on this. But of course, we cannot use our original points. We of course have to use to apply it to our transformed data. Okay, so we apply least squares to our transformed data points. And then we get these coefficients a1 and a2. But that's not what we want. What do we want? We want to know, of course, c and d. Now, how do we get c and d? Yeah, because we have substituted, so we have to, of course, apply the back substitution. So C now is uh, 10 power A1. Yeah? So if this is the log base to base 10, uh, you just have to invert the logarithm, that's it. Yeah? And uh, for D, okay, D is equal to A2, so there is no problem with D. Okay, here is another example where this trick works. I mean, here we apply the natural logarithm on left and right. So we get ln v is equal to ln a plus uh, b times u. Yeah. And now we do this appropriate substitution and again uh, we have a straight line a regression. These are two out of a few cases where such a trick works. No? If you have a function like sine x, then mm -hmm. also we could substitute sine x is equal to a and then solve the equations, right? It would be linear there. I'm from the back, so you're talking about uh, u is equal to sine of v, yeah? yeah? And then, oh no, sorry, uh, let's say um, c times the sine of d times v. Yeah? If you would have, yeah, let's try it we would apply the inverse of the sine here, yeah? which is the arcus sine. So we ha would have arc uh, sine of u is equal to, yeah, and now you see the problem. So you get arc sine of c times the sine of d times v. And I mean, now maybe we could be successful. Now you should try to apply uh, product theorems about the sign. But I don't know a formula which can, uh, which makes a sum out of something like that. So I guess this wouldn't work here. Okay, yeah. Um, this was about one dimensional function approximation. Yeah? So we are just talking about such a one dimensional axis x. But in many applications, we have functions depending on many variables, yeah? functions depending on vectors. And there are some cases where we can actually apply the method, we, the one-dimensional method to multi-dimensional data. When is this possible? Look at, um, yeah, I mean, this is the formula we had. We were talking about this one-dimensional case. 
So our function f of x is a linear combination of basis functions. I mean, that's very important for you to remind. That's where we can apply least squares. When our function is a linear combination of arbitrary, that's important, basis functions. Okay? And of course we can write this here as the vector a transposed, so you have a row vector here now, the, pr the transposed column vector a is a row vector, times the, this column vector f of x. I mean, this vector f now consists of these components, f1 of x up to fk of x. Okay? So maybe we should look at this again on the blackboard. Um, yeah. So we have a1 through ak times f1 of x to fk of x. That's what we have here, okay? And now, suppose this x, I mean the x here is just a number on this real axis. Now suppose this x is a vector and f1 is a function mapping such a vector onto a number. So it doesn't matter whether we input an, a vector here into f1 or whether we input a number. So this is just trivial um, to apply it to vectors. Isn't that nice? And it's even simpler if this function here is just the vector x. And then that's what we have. Our f of x is a1 times the first component of x up to a k times the kth component of x. But of course here, um, the number of coefficients has to be equal to the dimension of the input space. So this is a really special case, but that's important, that's important. So you can apply one-dimensional least squares to high-dimensional spaces. But what is the difficulty here? It's even more difficult than in the one-dimensional case. I mean, what's not difficult is solving the whole thing. You apply the same algorithm, no difference. But what is difficult here? It is difficult to find these basis functions because the basis functions, they have to be functions of many variables. Uh, now suppose we have k equal 4. Or, no, let me see. Yeah, I mean the, the dimension of these vectors here, this dimension of the space, uh, oh, that's a number we didn't have before, but suppose x vector, such an x vector is equal to x1 through xm. Okay? And now suppose m is equal to 4. And then our first basis function, f1 of such an x vector, um, has to be a function of four variables. It, uh, let me give an example. Let's say um, um, x1 plus square root of x2 plus the sine of x3 times x4. So you have to have an idea about many such basis functions 
And this is not really trivial. Okay? And there is a whole business. There is a whole business of finding such types of basis functions. And this is getting really difficult. Why is it getting really difficult? Why is this really difficult? Not because there are many variables here. Why is this really difficult? Richard, why is this difficult now? <laughs> Jetzt kommt's raus. Why is this difficult? Because of, I mean, no, I mean, my question was, why is it difficult to find such a function, the appropriate function? You don't have to use the sign. You could use whatever you want. Because there are infinitely many functions that you could use. But this is true in one-dimensional case, too. But let's look at the one-dimensional case. Why is it easy in the one-dimensional case? We use body down. That's, that's what you could do here too. The one dimensional case, you can see the data points and. Yes. Uh, that's the point. In one dimensions, everything is actually trivial. Because you look at the picture, you get an impression, and you would say, oh, that looks like a cubic function. And then you have an idea. What about 17 dimensional spaces? Who among can see it? Who can see it? I mean, do you have 17 dimensional eyes or impressions, whatever? I mean, that's the problem. In high dimensional spaces, you don't have any intuition anymore. And that's why we need, why we want to have function approximation algorithms which do not depend on some engineer having an intuition like that. And this is, I mean, this is the field of function approximation of applied statistics and this is called machine learning. Huh? I mean, that's a sub-area of artificial intelligence where people, we are given some data from a robot movement, whatever, and these always are high dimensional data, and we want to have universal mechanisms with universal types of such n dimensional basis functions, and the human engineer doesn't have to select these basis functions. And one example, I will present it next semester in the math lecture. Um, um, Richard, jetzt hilf mir. What is it? Uh, yeah. Ah, the uh, radial basis functions. Radial basis functions. So what we do is, in our n-dimensional space, we put Gaussian normal distributions, many of them, we distribute them over the whole space and our coefficients then determine the amplitude of these guys and it turns out uh, that with many such radial basis functions we can good, get very good approximations of arbitrary uh, function behaviors. Okay, but uh, so much for now, today. Thank you.